Well, I don't know about you, but I'm really excited for our topic today. Here, let me turn oh, light. for sure. Um, yeah, so just for a bit of introduction, um, a few years ago, our filters were part of this study. We didn't pay to be in the study. We didn't even really know we were part of the study until um, it was published. So um, yeah, it's kind of one of those things where it was a pleasant surprise because um, everything worked out exactly how we kind of knew it would. So just a little bit of foreshadowing there for the rest of the, the Instagram live. But what we're talking about is water filtration devices water filtration systems, whether they're under sink, pitcher, um, reverse osmosis, whole house, um, and their ability to remove PFAS chemicals. And so this study was done by Duke University um, in conjunction with NC State University. Um, and basically they collected different water samples from um, people mostly in North Carolina and tested the samples for PFAS, pre-filtration and post, um, to just kind of see like how, how well do these filters remove certain PFAS chemicals, you know, if at all. So, and I think another thing to mention is that it's pretty easy to assume that any old water filter will address PFAS. Because I think like when you go to a big box store and you go to the water filtration section or whatever it is, I think it's people just assume that a water filter is a water filter and it's, I'm purchasing it to make my water better and it will, you know, it will do its job. It will remove everything from the water. Or it will, you know, make my water taste amazing, which also means all the chemicals are gone. So there's, yeah, a, lot, there's a lot of assumptions built into yeah. that or those ex there's a lot of expectations and mm -hmm. um, yeah, they don't yeah, always I, live up to those expectations. Yeah. And I think like another assumption is, you know, why, why would I even need a water filter? Because isn't my municipality taking care of this? Isn't it, isn't like, you know, I pay these tax dollars for like water treatment. Isn't everything being addressed? So yeah. Right. You know, they say, well, I want everything taken out of my water. I want all the contaminants removed. Or another thing that I've heard from people is, you know, I'm on well water, but my water tastes great. So I'm sure it's fine. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, definitely excited to get into um, this topic. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, Christina is going to ask some questions. And these are questions that um, a couple of them are from our support channel because Aunt, uh, Christina answers a lot of the scientific related support questions. So it's a combination of that and then just some like general, what are the takeaways? Like what, what do I need to know about this study? So, yeah. So um, the Duke study that you mentioned, what's the key takeaway um, from the filtration study and why was the study so important? Yeah, so the, the key takeaway is that the technology exists. And I think that's like, just should be kind of giving everyone peace of mind that's like worried about PFAS that like, there are actually several different types of technologies that can remove it. So it's not just like, um, you don't have to spend an arm and a leg, you know, to get the only technology like this study um, was the first of its kind to really show the public that okay, we have the technology for like residential filtration of PFAS. So like it exists, everyone can like take a, you know, a deep breath. We know a lot of the health effects are horrendous and now we have a solution. So I think that's really the main takeaway is that this study was the first of its kind to, to test multiple different, um, different systems and different filtration media and different technologies. So it's, it's really a holistic way of looking at, all right, how are, we, how are we taking care of this? How are we addressing PFAS at the residential level? So, so I would at say the residential level, there's, yeah. there are um, solutions. So we don't have to depend on the municipality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
So how did some of the other brands perform and um, the other kinds of filters? Because there were definitely a lot of uh, different types of filters, a lot of different um, form factors. So yeah. how did you do? Yeah. So uh, yeah, just like you mentioned, it this the scope of the study was really broad. So um, reverse osmosis was part of the study, which is a really common um, type of water filtration. Under sink, which is what our filters are. Uh, there were some pitcher filters. There were some refrigerator filters, some whole house filters. So it was really a broad spectrum of filtration devices. So um, I won't like I won't name brands. I'll have uh, all of our our viewers and listeners go to uh, our actual article, which is online, um, just to kind of see, you know, what what um, uh, what those brands actually are. Um, so yeah, basically, some of the brands sorry my my dog can hear your dog oh that's good um it does turn out somebody came to the door and of course when the doorbell rings the dog's yeah. let me let me just <laughs> sorry okay all right isn't that so funny dogs can yeah <laughs> I think it's I somewhere. Say, did my dog set off your dog? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, okay, so yeah, I won't I won't mention the brands, but some of these uh, technologies failed pretty horrifically, um, and so that was really things like pitcher filters, um, whole house filters, and um, I think one of the refrigerator filters too, right? Yeah, yeah, and that really just comes down to the fact that they weren't designed to remove PFAS. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, yeah, and, and some of these brands are, you you definitely know them, you, you've oh, yeah. seen them, you know, in your in your local Target and, and stuff like that. So um, it was pretty shocking to us. But, you know, in their defense, this is a emerging contaminant and, you know, we're, we're all trying to figure it out, but um, it's really important to note that there was a huge discrepancy between the filters that performed really well and the perform the filters that performed pretty, pretty horrifically. Um, and so yeah. one, yeah, one of the, the things that I wanted to um, mention was that if you are looking at this study, one of the things that stands out is that the levels in the finished water, so the water that's been filtered for some of the for some of the devices is higher than exactly. the unfiltered water. And you're probably thinking, how is that even possible? It's it's coming from the same source. Like how mm -hmm. how can it, the levels be higher after it's passed through my pitcher filter, whatever it is? And so this was really something that we wanted to highlight today is that um these the media that is used in some of these brands is lower quality and it can you know actually oversaturate and then release out into the finished water if you're you know using the filter past the um, scope or the time that is allotted you know in the instruction manuals for the filter so you could actually be consuming PFAS levels that have accumulated in that media and that are higher than what you might be drinking if you're just using unfiltered water. So, and this goes for, for us as well and making sure that you, you're changing your um, filter within the scope or within the specs of like what every single company recommends. Um, and so, yeah, if you're, if, if you're reading our article or if you're looking at the actual, um, uh, study that's just something to keep in mind when you see that so just kind of like a um, public service announcement if you will is that once you have a, a water filter and you're not changing or once you have a water filter you have to change the media it's not just always going to it's just not going to always work in perpetuity like they, there are some exactly. actions you have to take so yeah maintenance is required for any 
filter system. Yeah. Um, and so just like a quick, you know, which filters won, which didn't, um, Hydro-Vive, our, our under-sink filters performed really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, and then reverse osmosis was the other technology that was mm -hmm. also the winner in this study. And so this is not surprising. We, we know that reverse osmosis is a great option. Right. Um, there are, of course, some downsides that we have on our Instagram and our blog that you should also definitely check out. Um, but that being said, it's a great option under sink and reverse osmosis were the winners in this study and and it's it's a really credible really credible study that um, we point people to all the time even though we came out looking great it it is the only one of its kind so yeah absolutely um yeah. and something else that always jumps out at me is even looking at filters and looking at you know, nonstick pans and stuff, you see on the labeling, it says PFOA and PFOS free, mm. um, or does not contain PFOA and PFOS, or it'll say, you know, you know, removes or is certified mm -hmm. to remove. But there's over 4,000 different kinds of PFAS compounds. So if PFOA and PFOS are the only ones they're talking about, can these filters also remove other types of PFAS chemicals? Yeah, that's a, it's such a good question. And I was just looking at the study because, yeah, that's a really good point. I feel like we are really only talking about PFOA and PFOS mm -hmm. and it's not anyone's fault. It's, it's, those are the two um, variations that are, you know, being talked about the most. Those are what states are typically regulating and it's what EPA has those um, health advisory levels for. So those are really the ones that are just always being talked about. Um, and I just counted and the Duke study tested, I think it was 11 or 12 different variations. So beyond the scope of what most um, like regulatory or state agencies are looking at. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's a great point. So if a water filter is able to remove those two, it's not always automatically guaranteed that it's going to remove uh, PFBA or Gen X or PFNA or w all of those other different um, variations. And so to figure that out, it's important to have that third party data, which we, yep. um, we really push not just our customers, but anyone who is thinking about buying a water filter, you want to know the the specs from that filtration brand beyond just like what um you know nsf is requiring not that an nsf is a great resource to start with but um yeah there are just so many other variations of pfas and that we need to kind of be um making sure that our filters removed so yeah absolutely yeah when we have customers asking us about the filters um, and they say, well, how does your comp yours compare to, you know, some other brand? Mm -hmm. I always say, let's go back to the data yeah, absolutely. and ask them for data. And what we provide is data in addition to, I mean, we don't just provide a list and say, well, it removes X percent of this compound and that's it. We actually show the data. Right. Yeah. So yeah, so just just definitely something something to consider when you're buying a water filter is like how much how much reliability does this brand have and is it backed by third party data? Like, can they really um, live up to the claims that are being made? So, yeah. And I wanted to mention one other thing because this question actually comes up a fair amount, especially with um, certain states having mm -hmm. specific um, re you know, regulatory levels, like New York is at 10 parts per trillion. And so they say, well, your filters go down to below method detection limits, less than mm -hmm. MDL. But what is that? What is that yeah. limit? So that's, that's actually you know, a very good question. I actually went back into the uh, original article, the original study to find out. Um, did you have it or you want me to go ahead? Yeah, 
Go ahead, yeah. So um, when they did their MDL testing, um, the range was from 0 0.001 to 2.68 nanograms per liter, which is parts per trillion. Mm -hmm. So the highest um, level that um, was still part of the MDL was 2.68 parts per trillion. So it's well below the 10 parts per trillion, which is the lowest state regulatory level for PFAS mm -hmm. at this time. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good point. And an MDL isn't a regulatory level, it's just specific to testing for a contaminant. So it's not like, oh, right. if it's anything is above the MDL, you're, you know, out of compliance, it's nothing like that. It's, it's just specific for testing, so. Yeah, so what a lot of the states will talk about is an MCL, mm -hmm. maximum contaminant level, which is a regulatory level, not to be confused with MDL, which is a um, method detection limit. So yeah, yeah. Lots, lots of acronyms here. Lots, yes, yes. Okay, so I think that just about covers it. Um, and if you're curious about the article that I was referencing, um, it's our Duke PFAS study. So if you go to our website and just type in Duke, um, it'll be the first article that comes up or Hydrovive Duke, whatever combination of the words. Um, and we also have some resources on our Instagram um, feed that talk about this study as well. Um, so I definitely recommend checking it out because some of the brands that were tested and performed poorly will shock you. Truly, mm -hmm. it's it's definitely eye opening. Um, so yeah, if you have questions about the study, DM us. You can send us an email, hello at hydrovive.com. Yep. Um, you can use our live chat on hydrovive.com, and it will likely be Christina answering all of your questions. And she loves doing it, so feel free. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. So yeah, I hope that everyone enjoyed this Instagram live and we will see you all next week. So have a good one. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.